everybody. I want to thank everyone for making the time to be here today. My name is Inez Ortiz and I am a program assistant at Sustainable T CT. And today we are joined by Yaprak Ona, the Associate Director of Research, David Murphy, the Director of Resilience Engineering, and Luann Cooley, a Legal Policy Fellow, <clears throat> excuse me, Fellow from the Connecticut Institute for Resilience and Climate Adaptation at UConn. So today they are going to walk us through how cities and towns can use the Climate Change Vulnerability Index that has been developed to plan for extreme heat. This tool is specifically referenced in our Sustainable CT Action 10.6, which focuses on planning and preparing for extreme heat. This action was also newly added in 2023, so this will be a great opportunity for us all to learn how to take advantage of this really helpful resource. And for anyone that is new to Sustainable CT on the line, we are a statewide municipal certification program that is intended to help cities and towns advance their overall sustainability. And when we reference sustainability, we reference it in a broad lens. So we're thinking about things like transportation, housing, arts and culture, the local economies, the natural environment, and more. So basically everything that you could think of that makes a community a great place to live, work, and play. Currently, nearly 80% of the state is participating in, in the program, and of that, about 40% is currently certified. So this webinar is also a part of our Climate Leader webinar series, which is meant to be a resource to towns who are seeking climate de climate leader designation, and this is a designation for municipalities who are actively trying to reduce harmful greenhouse gas emissions and preparing their communities for the impacts of climate change. This year alone, we have had six webinars in this series that you can find recorded on our website through a link that Jessica will put in the chat for everybody. And at the end of the webinar, we will have time to address everyone's questions, but please feel free to drop them in the chat as we go so they don't slip your mind. And with that, I would like to turn it over to my colleagues at Circa. Thanks, everyone. Oh, okay. Thank you so much for the introduction. I hope you can hear me now. Great. Um, so um, thank you so much for joining us and let's dive into it. Um, so during this webinar, what you're going to hear from us is like what the Climate Change Vulnerability Index is and um, what kind of information is used in this, like how we developed it. And we're going to show you a de demo and actual applications that you can use it for the planning and some uh, going to continue with like legal and policy tools with my colleagues, um, David and Luann. Um, so let's start with the general description of like what the vulnerability is in terms in case like you guys are not familiar with it was introduced to us first in uh, IPCC 2007 as the climate change vulnerability um, climate change vulnerability is a concept that describes like how strongly people or ecosystems are being affected by the climate change. So when we are uh, defining this, we need to, uh, you can look like different ways of doing an assessment and we wanted to go with the index because it helped us to set us our goals and methods that how we are um, doing this uh, information and it helped us to look for the best and uh, available science and then most recent data to define that climate change vulnerability and look for in regions in general for like what kind of assets or infrastructures or people are being affected the most by it. And um, we also like score uh, the vulnerabilities from this sense. And at the end, we also going to see like how the results are showing with different towns and we will able to present that to you. So in terms of vulnerability um, index, what it does, it's actually overlaying like a bunch of information on top, on top of it, each other. So it is really a cumulative index that shows uh, different types of data and it visualizes the patterns, like what the patterns are look like in terms of vulnerability, which regions are vulnerable, which regions are not. And when we are looking for the scores, uh, what it represents, it's really comparing each, like the cell that you're seeing with a different one within the state. So we are looking at it as a whole and a comparison is done within the state. And this is not a risk tool. It is 
actually allowing us a first screening tool to do action. So you can see which regions are more vulnerable and what is really contributing to that vulnerability. So you can start talking and planning and making decisions based on that. So climate vulner change vulnerability depends on several factors, like how the type of the climate change is impacting and in terms of like the sensitivity and exposure to the system and what kind of adaptive capacity or resilience that system is going through. So these three concepts here is sensitivity. Think about it that without any effect, without any climate change, these communities, these ecosystems or groups are already vulnerable. They are sensitive due to their natural um, structure, which I'm going to give examples in a bit that it's going to make a little bit more sense. Exposure is that this external impact that we are putting here, like that can be physical environmental conditions or climate conditions in this case. An adaptive capacity that every system that we are looking is resilient within its own nature. Some of are more resilient, some of are less resilient. So all of them are combined, are giving the vulnerability in its definition. So when we are creating the climate change vulnerability index, like I mentioned, we are using a bunch of different information. So all of this information are our main contributors and it needs to be statewide and in high resolution for us to use it. Then this information can be in social build capacity or ecological uh, uh, indicate to represent the indicators. What I mean by indicators, this all um, raw information out there is put it in a system, in a gridded system that you are seeing here, which each cell is 10 acre. And um, by relative scored within each other from the most to less impacted. And now we put them under the, uh, our component buckets, whether they are representing exposure, sensitivity, or adaptive capacity. And at the end with our equation, we have the vulnerable scores. So you're going to see a color-coded maps, which the darker the color is, the higher the score is, and the more vulnerable that region is represented. So how we decided working with this, uh, in, as part of the Resilient Connecticut, we first decided to do a coastal vulnerability index. We, our uh, focus was mostly in like coastal flooding, but then we don't want to just limit ourselves with the political boundaries and to use this as a planning tool for uh, with CCBI 1.0 in New Haven and Fairfield counties. We see the need for like making it bigger for a statewide so that we expanded into heat and flood vulnerability, uh, coastal vulnerability indices. So we are using this uh, 2.0 is the one that we are going to show you right now to decide on our resilience opportunity areas. So we can actually decide where we are going to do some adaptation information. And in terms of heat, including the heat vulnerability in the index, provides us like valuable information for adaptation planning and policymaking. It helps us to identify areas that require investments in heat mitigation measures, such as like urban planning strategies, improving building codes, early warning systems, or uh, public health interventions. By understanding um, the specific vulnerabilities related to heat, it helps the decision makers and us to allocate resources uh, more effectively and develop strategies to reduce the risk can be associated with extreme heat. Um, so with mapping the heat vulnerability, we are actually helping this equation by raising the impact with adapt providing adaptation solutions. So there are three buckets and there are different data that's been used in those buckets. I'm gonna go over them very briefly and put a link uh, in the chat box that where you can reach the fact sheet too. So in exposure, we have like physical categories and climate categories. Like climate category is like a maximum land surface temperature that we get from the Landsat satellites and emissivity and traffic emissions, impervious surfaces, building density. These are all like physical external stressors that's actually increasing or negatively impacting the exposure to the heat. Then we have the sensitive category. As I mentioned before, that this category, without even any kind of external factor, makes the system very susceptible. So we have social uh, category mostly from the census tracts that we get all this information. Like, for example, where outside employment makes the people more vulnerable, uh, more susceptible to any kind of impact. And once you add the heat to it, it's worse. So the uh, that's kind of the perspective that you need to look for the social sensitivity. And build is like, private wells or median uh, structure age, uh, public housing units, these are all the things that are already there impacting the uh, susceptibility of that region. 
An adaptive capacity, as I mentioned, that it's ability of coping. Like for example, in, we have the social and ecological category. If you are under a more shaded area with the tree cover, of course, you are a little bit more resilient to the heat impacts. Or for example, if you're close to a cooling center, that's going to make you like more adaptive to the heat uh, rising temperatures. So that is the perspective that we are looking for. And we have a fact sheet and all the related resources information are on our website, which I'm gonna go and show you in a bit and put in the chat box too. So this, of course, effort was not created in a night. Um, it has been like a working effort and we contracted with SLR Consulting and the team were there uh, with previous members and current members. And then circuit team really helped us to show you the beaver right now. So we can now dive into it. I'm gonna open my browser. Okay, so this is the website, which I'm gonna uh, put it in the chat box at the CCVI website that you can find all the information here. Uh, we also have a flood weaver that you can go into or a heat weaver, fact sheets, webinar videos, presentations, everything in the development is on this page. When you click on the heat weaver, you're gonna go into this general heat, uh, climate change vulnerability index heat page where the, you will have an introduction about this um, whole tool, how to use the tool. And there are buckets of like heat vulnerability, heat exposure, I'm gonna zoom out a little bit. Yeah. Heat vulnerability, heat exposure, heat sensitivity, heat adaptive capacity, all these things that you'll be able to look at it uh, one by one. And there's also a heat data statistics portion where you can see the related information about the data that we use, how we rank them, and for town statistics. If you want to go to the full out vulnerability, you can click over here. So let's go to the heat vulnerability because that's related. So when you see this map, this like it's a heat map, it's going to show the darker areas are more vulnerable. So you can zoom in and out and then go to this general extent or on the right, you can see the legend at this tab. You can see which layers are active. You can go to the bookmarks, which I'm gonna zoom into the capital region or print your own map and for the region that's specific for you. There's also a search bar and then changing the base map that whichever that you want to do. The general picture is giving like which areas are more vulnerable. If you would like to learn more information, you need to zoom in to that region and then click on any cell that you want to look for. So in this cell, when you open it up, it's going to show you the scores for sensitivity, exposure, adaptive capacity, and vulnerability. Let's try to make this bigger. Uh, and vulnerability, generally adaptive capacity, exposure, and sensitivity are ranking from one to five. So the five, the higher the score is, the more of that field is going on, whether they're more sensitive, more exposed, more adaptive. Um, but in vulnerability, we normalized it and then make the scale between zero to one. So one is the worst condition. So if it is like 0 0.6 to seven, I can see from the legend here, it's in the darkest region. So it is a very vulnerable region to heat. And uh, if you don't want to read all that little details, there is a nice graphical representation here. I can just uh, hover my mouse over it and see that, oh, exposure is actually high in here. So that's really the main contributor. And I can go to the different graph and then see all the middle little categories of the components and see that um, climate exposure is actually very high in here. And it is socially very adaptive region. So to learn more information, I can jump to the different maps. I can click on any tab again, or the specific one that you were looking on and learn what is really causing that like climate exposure very high. And I also have the graphs for that um, to represent in physical exposure. Oh, there are a lot of impervious surfaces here. There are a lot of buildings around here. So I can learn that information. I can go to the sensitivity, click on any region again and get the scores. Or I can go to my graph and see that there are a lot of old structures around here. And I can see from the social, oh, there's lots of minoritized communities um, living here that are being impacted more or they are a lot of community that don't have a high school diploma, but they're over the age of 25. I can go to the adaptive capacity. It's in the reverse way here, because like you can see the Hartford area is the lighter the color. So what I said before is the higher the score, the more of that thing is going on. So the higher the score of adaptive capacity, the more adaptive that region is. So it makes sense that the city is not really that adaptive 
in terms of like in general score, but I can see that in social adaptive scores are higher for the specific area that I'm looking for, like they're close to the shelters, they're close to the cooling centers, um, but in general, ecological uh, sensitivity is low because there's less tree cover, less vegetation. So these kind of a contributor impacts that you'll be able to understand it using um, heat vulnerability index. So with that, I'm gonna give the screen to my colleague, David Murphy, to tell you about the applications. Thank you. Yeah, Prak, you always go so quickly. <laughs> and you leave me so much time, so thank you. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. I do have a contractor in the house, so um, if you hear drilling, that's what that is. All right, so I'm going to talk about some of the ways that we use the CCVI. And I, I just want to say before I start that it's been really rewarding to get to take something from uh, the state that, that Yaprak described to the point where we're using it. And to borrow a phrase from many other programs, it really takes a village. It's going to take all of us to to figure out how to use this tool. And um, I'll go through some examples right now. So in general, we've kind of noticed that there's four categories of use emerging. There's the category, which is the first one here on the board, where we're using it internally to identify project areas to then later on execute within the Resilient Connecticut framework. Then after we have selected project areas and started implementing them and conducting the studies, we're using the tool within those projects. We're starting to uh, find other ways to use the tool outside of the Resilient Connecticut program, such as the Capital Region Hazard Mitigation Plan, which we'll take a look at. And then really most excited about the number four here, which is the ways that I see the tool being used outside of the programs that Circa administers. So with that, let's just jump into the first category. So um, a couple of years ago, when we were working in Fairfield County and New Haven County on the Resilient Connecticut program, we needed to find a way to identify in those two counties, which is 51 towns, the places where we wanted to look further and conduct studies to address unmet climate needs. And one way that we did that was to overlap, overlay the heat and flood CCVI tools. Of course, we're talking about heat mostly today. Um, with these things called zones of shared risk, which are areas of shared climate risks that, and also implied shared solutions. So the graphic that you see here is a summary graphic from our report from a couple of years ago. This is downtown Danbury. You can see an aerial photograph on the right hand side is the flood vulnerability grid cells in that zone of shared risk. The lower right, that's the heat vulnerability grid cells, remember darker colors, more vulnerable. And then the lower left is where they overlap. And there's a really handy matrix there that shows the relative flood and heat vulnerabilities in that zone of shared risk. And you can see anything in the upper right side of that grid box is in the higher range for both vulnerabilities. So we took that and built these information sheets for 64 areas in those two counties that have these unmet climate needs. And you can see in the summary sheet here, the flood heat and social vulnerabilities are all very high. And this area has moved on to become a phase three type project where we're looking for um, ways to reduce flooding and extreme heat vulnerabilities in downtown Danbury. Here's an example from the Fairhaven part of New Haven. Again, you can see all of the Fairhaven Peninsula was called the zone of shared risk because it has some isolation risks that the whole area shares. And you can see on the right hand side the flood vulnerability, the lower right, the heat vulnerability, and then that matrix in the middle on the bottom with the hot colors is where the heat and flood vulnerabilities together intersect to create this, this greater climate vulnerability. And this has also become a project where we're looking for ways to address flooding and extreme heat in the Fairhaven part of New Haven. So this is the summary sheet that many of you have seen before in previous webinars, shows the flood heat and social vulnerabilities in that area. So uh, we use that process to identify places to do more work. And um, I'm gonna take you through a couple of those examples right now. I'm very excited about these. I'm gonna try to contain myself because I get really animated. So this is, <laughs> this is a graphic from the Fairhaven study. 
we're happy that the city agreed to work with us. And you can see um, this image is straight from the CCVI for extreme heat. And you can see the very dark color over Fairhaven, which is partly due to impervious surfaces, but also partly due to the social sensitivity factors. But also, as we've learned, this area has a little bit further to go than other parts of the city to reach cooling centers and shelters. And that's an important factor in this, in what you're seeing, the expression of vulnerability. So we're currently looking for kind of a community resilience hub to be sited somewhere in Fairhaven so people can use that and not have to cross the Mill River or the Quinnipiac River to get to a cooling center. This is an example from the project we're working on in South Norwalk. You can see a little graphic on the left hand side, just a, a teaser for what the heat CCVI looks like in the South Norwalk area. And then the consultant in this project is working on some uh, cross sections, you can see them in the view in the middle of the page on what the potential heat contributors are and how that would feel to someone walking on the street. And we're using this to look for ways to cool the area. And then this one's um, really interesting. I think if you're a numbers person, you'll love this one. If you like graphics, you won't. But um, this is a project where we're looking for appropriate cooling centers in the city of Insonia. And in this, in this table, in this matrix, it's a very simple scoring methodology. You can see the column over towards the right, which is a direct expression of a heat CCVI. So the three, four, four, three in that column, which is the third to the right from the right. That's a direct use of the CCVI scores in this matrix to look for new cooling centers. So it's a really exciting way to use the tool this is nothing that someone's going to you know, write up in a journal article as a way to do complicated math. It's a simple scoring approach, but it's a direct use of the CCVI scores, which we're, we're finding to be really beneficial to looking for cooling center locations. I wanna go through a couple examples um, where Thurk <coughs> is working on using the CCVI right now that are sort of outside of the Resilient Connecticut framework. And, um, we are serving as the contractor to Capital Region Council of Governments for their hazard mitigation plan update. It's kind of a unique arrangement that is, is atypical with what Circa does, but it was found to be beneficial to, to use us for the update because we're also looking for projects for Resilient Connecticut in the same region. So um, my colleagues in the phone, uh, Nicole, for example, helped work on this story map, which is about to go live. This is a view from the first page. And you can see that in this update, we're addressing extreme storms, tidal flooding along the Connecticut River, changing precipitation patterns, rising temperatures and earthquakes, which are all the things that a person typically would address in a hazard mitigation plan. But what's been really interesting is working with the towns and meeting with them to facilitate some of the discussions related to extreme heat. Because it won't surprise many of you to know that in most towns in Connecticut, we sort of get blank stares in the room and people say, I think we're good, we don't really have a problem. Um, but that's also what we say about flooding. And then as we were reminded this week, when you get eight inches of rain, all bets are off. So uh, here's an example of the graphics that we used just a couple of weeks ago, meeting with Suffield and Manchester. And what we like to do is use the tool to really facilitate a discussion about what the solutions should be, because in Suffield, it might not surprise you to see that the darker colors are happening where there's agriculture, tobacco fields, outdoor workers, people who are not shielded from extreme heat. Whereas in Manchester on the right hand side, it's an expression of development and density. So that's two very different drivers for extreme heat vulnerabilities. And that helps us work with the towns to draw out of them ideas for solutions. If we didn't have this tool, we would just be staring at a map of impervious surfaces and assuming that's what's driving extreme heat vulnerabilities, whereas in Suffield, that's not the case. So it's another cool way to use the tool. And um, I wanna just run through a couple random examples that I pulled together in things that are happening sort of outside of Circa, ways that people are using this tool. And if you haven't um, been closely paying attention to my discussion, that's okay. But now I'm gonna ask you to really pay attention because we're gonna rely on all of you to take this tool and do the same thing when you're working on plans in Connecticut. So we're very excited that the Stratford update to the plan of conservation development has a little image with our flood and heat vulnerabilities made it into the draft. I'm really excited that it wasn't cut out. Um, so you'll eventually see when you look at the 
the Stratford POCD, this map in the center of the page. And you can see on the right hand side is the opposing page in the draft, which talks about those extreme heat vulnerabilities and the challenges uh, that will be coming up in Stratford. So we've made it through the first cut with the advisory committee. We think this is all going to stay. Um, so we're super excited about this. Doing the same thing in Fairfield. We don't have a map. The map didn't make it into the plan. That's OK. You can see on the right hand side here the resilience framework, which talks about trying to incorporate this resilience strategy as a main component of their POCD, which is new for them. They've been doing all this good work anyway, but they haven't really set it in an active way. So if you look at this other page here, we have um, these concepts that we've incorporated into the plan, resilient neighborhoods, resilient hubs, and that resilient hub discussion talks about management of extreme heat and looking for ways to consolidate uh, extreme heat management in these places with the assumption that they'll be needed going forward in the coming decades to manage uh, the population's response to extreme heat. Um, the hazard mitigation plans, just one more example. This one kind of happened uh, over the past year, the Southeastern Connecticut hazard mitigation plan update. And we did have some early versions of the heat CCVI that we used. Here's a view from Southeastern <coughs> Connecticut. You can see city of Groton, town of Lebanon on the right. And again, like I showed you with Suffield and Manchester, there's an expression of impervious surfaces in some places in the heat CCVI, but in others, it's agricultural land outdoor workers. And then this is an example of how we put together extreme heat challenges and highlighted them for that plan update. You can see them. Each town got a summary sheet and the middle box in each one is the extreme heat statement of challenges and then potential solutions. So the tool was used directly for this process. And then the last example I have is a watershed plan that's getting started in uh, the Bruce Brook area of Stratford and Bridgeport. And we were told that the that the EPA wants to start seeing a resilience angle in these watershed based plans. We concur. It's a great idea. And so we're looking at the heat CCVI in this watershed because the idea is we'll find projects, especially green infrastructure that have the co benefits of reducing heat exposure and also improving water quality. And I, I'm really glad that Yaprak went through this because I'm going to end on this note. Sometimes it isn't enough to just look at the heat vulnerability score on the right hand side. Sometimes it's better to look at those individual scores. So the right hand side, left hand side is a composite, the right hand side is the exposure. And so as we work on this watershed plan, our job will be to look at the exposure. We can't affect social factors in a watershed plan, but we can affect the exposure. So it's good to dive into the details when you have them. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Luann. Great, thanks, Dave. Okay. So hopefully you can see. See everything there. Okay, so I'm Luann Cooley. I'm the legal fellow at Circa. And as my colleagues have shown you today uh, about the development of the climate change vulnerability index um, and some of the uses it's been put to so far, uh, I'm going to expand on that and in how the CCBI can be used in coordination with existing legal authority to address climate vulnerabilities like increasing heat. Luann, I'm just going to stop you. You're sharing your other, you have two screens, right? I have many screens. I've got the wrong one. Yes. <laughs> are you sure? Okay, I don't, I th are you sure? Is that? It's not a full view of um, slides. Okay. It's mini view of slides. Okay, hang on a second. Sorry about that. I think you just might need to put it in presentation mode. Yeah. All right. Sorry about that. I was working earlier. Okay. All 
Oh boy. Um, let's see which one I've got here. Oh. Let's try that. How's that? Is that working? You're, um, you're not sharing your screen now. Just give us a minute. Sorry, it's just taking time. Loading. Yeah. Right. No, it's now. the other. <laughs> that's the presenter view. Maybe if you do the swap displays on the. <sighs> so sorry, it looks exactly the same as I was doing it earlier. So I'm not sure how. No worries. Oh. I once recorded a whole different screen of a tutorial. So. <laughs> <laughs> And Luann, the first time you had it pulled up, it did show your slides and they weren't in the viewer. Yeah, they were in the us. for us mode. But if you just maybe make the yeah, screen a little a bit second. bigger, we can look on that. Hang on. I think we're gritty it. here. We can look at a, a different kind of view. <laughs> Sorry about that, everybody. OK, let's try this again. Let's try that. Let's try. Okay. How's that? What are we seeing now? Sorry, everyone. So put that you in see... play mode and see if yeah. it, how it looks for us. All right. It is in play mode, but okay. Because for my view, it looks like I'm sharing the correct screen, but is that maybe working? just like um... no. still not seeing it. <laughs> yeah. Well. <laughs> Oh my gosh. of having multiple screens. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry about this. Okay, let me try one more time. Let me start. How's that? I say let's go for it from this. Okay. Okay, I'm really sorry. Okay. No apologies. Okay. So uh, again, I'm Luann Cooley, legal follow here at Circa, uh, and I'm gonna talk to you about how uh, the CCBI can be used for um, some other things, including um, as a tool for developing a rezone, a resilient zoning. So municipal, municipalities have existing legal and policy tools to use that they can limit to limit the impacts of urban heat. Uh, things like building codes, the 2022 Connecticut State Building Code went into effect in October 1st of last year. And this new state building code is based on model codes, including the 2021 International Building Code. Building codes can have an impact on urban heat by dictating kinds of materials uh, or heating and cooling systems that are used in construction. Uh, other kinds of policy tools are things like tree ordinances. Municipalities can adopt ordinances to manage public trees trees and the shade they produce have a big impact on localized heat. Uh, there are many state statutes concerning trees. Uh, the Deep Division of Forestry, in fact, compiled a list of over 150 state statutes uh, uh, dealing with trees. So there is plenty of legal authority for protecting trees and for regulating their placement. Towns can also have plans of conservation and development that can include guidance on improving community infrastructure, preserving natural spaces, and could include plans for addressing excessive heat. As we've already seen today, several towns that are currently on, um, revising their plans of conservation and development uh, have included things like climate vulnerability, um, especially dealing with heat. And as we continue to see these increasingly hot summers, um, and as more plans of conservation and development are updated, uh, hopefully more will address climate sensitive issues like heat and development will need to be consistent with these plans. Uh, so today I wanna to talk about zoning because in the zoning, um, municipalities have a really powerful and flexible legal authority that can be adapted to addressing emergent climate change issues like increasing heat. Um, so in addressing the problem of increasing heat, we have to think about 
the immediate needs of the people struggling on hot days like today, but we also need to look at trying to find those long-term solutions. And first, uh, we need to know the scope and scale of the problem, which is why the work of scientists and engineers like Yaprak and David are so important. Um, we need to know where it's hot and why it's hot in those places to effectively meet the public health needs of the people that are most impacted. Uh, but also, we need to think about the longer-term mitigation strategies, like increasing energy efficiency, reducing vehicle miles traveled, increasing renewable energy, and incentivizing electrification that will help to reduce greenhouse gases and slow climate warming. And for example, ah, here we Sorry, go. Sorry, Luan, your screen was not moving, so I wanted to go through that. Do you see, do you see my screen? I do, yes. Okay. But Are you on I, this slide? I was not. I'm one back. You were, uh, yes, you were on this one. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Sorry. Um, nope, that's okay. Now, hold on. I've got to figure out how to see my notes. <laughs> okay. Um, right. So, okay. So, as I was saying, my um, my colleague at Circa, uh, Kurt's, Kurt Mayland, who's Circa's Energy Legal Fellow, he's compiled a guide that will help municipalities to take advantage of incentives in the Inflation Redu Reduction Act that can help increase municipal energy resilience. Um, and we can put a link to the chat, uh, to that in the chat, perhaps. Um, and um, we also need to think about how uh, to increase heat by encouraging greater tree cover and vegetative protection zones using things like re reflective building materials or green and cool roofs, incorporating uh, protecting public space into design. And these adaptation responses can be addressed uh, through zoning regulations. Thank you. Uh, so in um, why are we focusing on zoning? In towns in Connecticut are authorized by state government to regulate how land use can be used through zoning under Connecticut General Statute Section 8-2 to 8-13A. And each town's legislative body can adopt the provisions in the statute detailing the powers of a zoning commission, its makeup, and the extent of zoning commission's authority. So guided by planning and development staff and consistent with those town plans of conservation and development, uh, zoning commissioners can pass regulations to decide what land can be put to, what uses land can be put to and in what areas with the intent to protect the health and safety of all. And as climate change threatens people and the environment, municipalities can implement strategic land use planning and zoning regulations to improve local climate adaptation uh, and resilience and direct development away from vulnerable areas. Okay, so um, next I'm going to talk about some of the specific tools and examples from Connecticut communities of how zoning can reduce urban heat. So, um, First of all, the type of zoning code matters. Uh, in traditional Euclidean zoning, specific uses are permitted or prohibited in areas with the intent of separating potentially incompatible uses. But in form-based codes, which many communities are moving towards, um, they are more designed to um, regulate the built form of the environment um, and emphasize detailed design standards. So some towns in Connecticut that have already uh, moved to form-based codes are Canton, Hamden, Windsor, Simsbury, and Hartford. Um, both the Canton and the Hartford code have um, been have winning awards for uh, their reorganization into this kind of a code. Um, so with a form-based code, um, it can be better at addressing urban heat uh, based on a research published by uh, Harris, Middle, and Muller in 2020. Um, the flexible framework of a form-based code can allow for regulation of building types and structures, and this can have a mitigating effect on heat by increasing airflow, regulating vegetation, and providing for public spaces with shade. So um, we can go to the next slide then. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so, Probably the most important thing um, that zoning can do is regulating uh, green space and landscaping. And again, remember, you can use the CCVI um, to look at areas in your town in which um, vegetation it, it may be missing or um, or not uh, very dense. And so, you know, after you understand where those areas are, then you can think about um, a changing zoning to um, increase the use of vegetation in landscaping. So because trees and green spaces um, 
can ameliorate increasing heat. Um, there can be differentials, in fact, of up to 10 to 20 degrees between neighborhoods with tree canopies and those without. And it's often correlated with environmental justice issues. Uh, tree canopy and vegetation can, can, in fact, be an equity issue um, in certain towns. So trees create shade by keeping the area under them from heating and retaining heat. They disrupt wind. They hold soil moisture. Uh, and zoning regulations can be used to mandate tree planting, tree maintenance, and care, including uh, what types of trees are used in what locations so there's a good match for the area uh, to increase survivability. This is an example of where context is extremely important. Uh, all trees are not created equally and they won't survive in, um, in all areas. They don't um, make the same kinds of shade and they don't deal well in the same soil. So um, context is really important when crafting a zoning code that would deal with trees. Uh, and notice in this example from the Hartford Zoning Code, Street trees are really just one type of regulated landscaping. Um, Hartford Code also requires vegetated buffers on frontages and around waterways. Um, and this also increases permeable surfaces that can absorb rain in addition to providing more cool surface area. So, you know, you'll notice that a lot of these um, types of solutions that we're talking about today to deal with heat also ha um, help with other effects as well, especially things like flooding. Um, so let's see on our next slide then. Um, another regulation uh, that can help with urban heat um, is uh, through regulation on reflective surfaces. Reflective surfaces can help reduce heat of large and perfious areas like rooftops or parking lots. Um, a dark asphalt parking lot, for example, in the sun absorbs heat and reflects it back and light colored or reflective surfaces on, on the other hand don't absorb heat. So the surface areas around them don't get as hot. Um, in the photo in this slide, um, you can see that the there's a, a light colored and a dark colored parking lot right next to each other. Uh, and the light colored parking lot is 40% cooler than the dark side. And this is you know, fairly simple to regulate. Um, New Haven, for example, adopted zoning regulations requiring any new site or expanded site with a half acre or more of impervious surface, not including roofs, um, to be at least 50% either shaded or constructed from reflected material. Uh, and just yesterday, researchers at Purdue University announced the development of a new whitest white paint that's specifically designed to reduce heat um, when applied to uh, surfaces in urban settings. So, so of course, you know, reflective roof materials can also be required through zoning regulations. So next slide. Um, so green roofs, uh, roofing makes up a lot of surface area. And the idea about green roofs as a heat reduction tool has been around for quite a long time. Uh, it's a low impact design green roof that is one that's planted with vegetation that's usually fairly low maintenance and drought resistance, and it serves to reflect heat, to insulate, and can also absorb storm wash water. Uh, UConn Center for Land Use Education and Research has done you know, really nice work on green roofs and produced some educational materials, including um, a pretty cool green roof infrastructure story map of UConn stores campus with videos about a few of the many green roofs on the Yukon buildings. Uh, the cost of green roofs can vary and it's often really prohibitive for residential properties, but it can make sense on municipal, municipal uh, industrial or commercial buildings. And for this reason, cities like New Haven, Stratford and Hartford have used um, the inclusion of a green roof as an incentive um, for a development bonus. The green roof in this picture, for example, is from the Whitney Water Treatment Plant in New Haven, and it has the largest green roof in the state uh, of over 30,000 square feet, and it covers the surface of the water treatment plant. All right, next slide then. Um, and then another idea for lessening the impact of heat is to have regulations about protecting public spaces from weather conditions. Now, this might seem, um, you know, fairly uh, straightforward, but you know, including things like requiring shade trees or structures in public transit stops will uh, help to alleviate heat for those people who are, are waiting for um, public transit. Um, it can also, again, be used as incentives for uh, a development bonus. Um, uh, in new construction, um, or you can regulate this through design standards or guidelines uh, when you're developing a form-based code. Right, so the next slide. Um, so we talked about design standards or guidelines. 
these can be used to ameliorate heat by um, mandating the types of materials, reflectivity of surface, um, landscaping or tree placement, but also building spacing and height for airflow. Airflow turns out to be really important um, for uh, dealing with um, increased urban heat. And in Connecticut, in Public Act 2129 established a commission to create a statewide form-based model code. Um, form-based model codes use design standard guidelines to describe building characteristics based on a range of forms and materials um, and help provide a policy statement for what is acceptable. Many towns already use design standards and guidelines in their zoning codes. Um, and it could be another way of addressing heat by requiring you know, these certain types of materials, surfaces, trees, um, or building placements and things like that. Okay, and that's actually all that I have. And I just wanted to say thank you on behalf of all of us at Circa for giving us the opportunity to talk with you today. Thanks very much. Okay, well, I want to say thank you again to the team at Circa for taking some time to present this really cool tool to us today. And now we have a little more than 10 minutes to open up any questions that anyone might have had. I know I can start off with one question. One question that I had um, was, how does all this really neat data in this tool stay updated over time as things change? So if a town um, per se loses tree cover or they gain more tree cover or things like that, how does this tool stay updated in current? I can't take that. Um, so obviously, the any kind of a data is not static. This tool is not static either. Um, so every kind of a th um, information change, the tool needs to be changed too. So the, the current one that we have, we are planning to use it for a while, like five years at least, because it's a, it's a big project to go through all that data analysis, updated scoring, deciding on it. And with new information coming up, I, how we developed it from coastal vulnerability to 1.0 CCVI to 1.2, we added, subtracted different informations to obtain this version 2.0. So when there's time to create 2.0, you may see more information or less information to reflect the situation. Um, so that is again uh, going to be true. Like the more the recent data is update uh, of the date we'll see that if there's a lot of information available that needs to be updated, then we'll try to do a 3.0. But yeah, that's for years to come. Great, thank you. And for Luann, we have a question in the chat. Um, you had mentioned the IRA funding and could you speak about any funding opportunities for towns to address extreme heat? Yeah, sure. Um, to be, you know, perfectly honest, I'm not sure I know of any specifics about the um, in the IRA that would work for towns. But for individuals, one thing that may be helpful for those um, who can take advantage of it is there are tax credits for the installation of things like heat pumps. So if you um, can uh, afford to upgrade your heating um, and cooling system, that's a really excellent way to go about it. You can get up to 30% um, off the purchase and installation of a heat pump up to a couple of thousand dollars. Um, and that can be a, a, a lower the cost of adding in air conditioning, which I know a lot of homes in Connecticut um, don't have because traditionally we haven't really needed it. Um, so for individuals, that's something that can be helpful. Uh, I'm not sure about uh, ways that towns can take advantage of that, but that's certainly something that, um, that our teams can look into. If I could just jump in for one second, I know the question was was more about one funding source, but we're starting to already see communities use uh, this information for grant applications. The city of Insonia uh, developed a grant application for community investment funds, which is a different funding source um, for making the, the armory into a cooling center based on the matrix that I showed earlier. So um, if there isn't a funding source that seems like it fits, reach out to us and we might have ideas and others. Thank you, David and Luann. 
Um, Emily in the chat also asked if you could share the link for the guide that Luann had mentioned about how municipalities can use the Inflation Reduction Act incentives to increase resilience. Yeah, I'd be happy to share that. I'm for some reason it's not I'm not able to post that in the anything in the chat at the moment. Um, but if someone else from Circa could do that, the guide is up on the Resilient Connecticut webpage under planning under white papers. And uh, it was it just came out last month and it serves as a, a guide for towns that um, may not be aware of the different kinds of incentives that are available for addressing uh, energy resilience. It's not energy resilience is kind of a new thing for towns to start thinking about. Um, but as we uh, start having more extreme weather events, um, it's the kind of thing that um, towns may be thinking about in terms of adding in microgrids, taking advantage of community solar, uh, and things like that. And so the grid uh, the guide actually has about, uh, it's about a 30 page long guide that goes through a lot of different types of incentives that are available to towns to take advantage of and um, give some advice on how they might go about that. Awesome. Thank you for that explanation, Luann. That was very helpful. Sure. Um, does anyone else have any more questions before I take up some more time with my questions? Okay, so I will ask another one. So, um, Luann, it was really interesting when you went into how zoning is such a beneficial tool when trying to reduce heat vulnerability. I was wondering if you or anyone on your team could go into some more examples of other forms of solutions that you guys have explored with towns. Should we all just... Throw yeah. answers in there. <laughs> I think I think David should take that because uh, yeah, Resilient City has been working on um, like seven projects right now with contractors yeah. to develop mm -hmm. adaptation solutions and. Okay, yeah. So a good example is Danbury, which is one of the examples I had um, in one of my one of my slides. So that project is mostly about reducing flooding in downtown Danbury, but there's two important aspects related to extreme heat. One is that it's also looking for a cooling center. The city has used, this is not a joke, has used the ice rink in the past and really didn't know if that should be an official cooling center. And so we're helping them to make that decision by looking at the heat, heat CCVI relative to bus routes and pedestrian routes to the ice rink. But that project also, in the addressing of the, the flood vulnerabilities is partly infrastructure, stormwater infrastructure, but it's also green infrastructure. So we're looking for places to install green infrastructure that have true co-benefits that will reduce flooding and will reduce heat exposure, which is which is awesome, right? Because we don't always have a chance to to site green infrastructure for, for cooling and then plug it into a stormwater model to see if it also will reduce flooding. So we're looking for some co-benefits from that front. So that's kind of two different ways of addressing extreme heat. It's having some place to go and trying to cause less heat to be at ground level in the first place. Awesome. That's a very cool example in Danbury. As for the cooling centers, um, just for a little bit of my own knowledge, do cooling centers need to be designated as cooling centers? Or for example, if um, a town has a, let's say a public library that's open to the public during their hours, could that be considered a cooling center if they do allow residents to go there in times of extreme heat? We, we face this question a lot um, in, when we're meeting with the municipalities for these, these plan updates and for Resilient Connecticut, they oftentimes will sort of say, oh yeah, people can go to, to the library, but libraries are closed on Sundays now post COVID, right? The one in West Hartford here used to be open every day and now it's not. And so how do you deal with that? The hours are limited. We've actually heard of libraries that don't have generators. So how is the air conditioning going to work? So there's a whole myriad of questions that will push back on the towns and say, have you thought about all these things? And um, it, it's for a good dialogue to go through all that. But libraries are certainly a viable place. Um, I think it's I think it's good to have a couple official and a couple unofficial in every town. And that's just my opinion, though. 
And thank you, Yaprak, for sharing that link in the chat on some more information on cooling centers in Connecticut. I'm definitely going to look into that. Um, I want to open up to if anyone else has any questions for the group before we wrap up in just a few minutes. Halavi has their hand raised, so please feel free to come off mute and ask your question. Thank you so much. Um, so my question was actually. Hi, uh, this is Danica Jaroski. I'm I'm the urban forester, so I can't. I'm sorry. Uh, I okay. I, I'll I'll just go back to asking my question. So I was interested in the watershed based. Um, analysis that was shown um, and I, I worked with the Watershed uh, Association in um, Massachusetts for almost 20 years. And it's really exciting to see how the heat information or data is kind of being overlaid uh, with the watershed based uh, infrastructure. Uh, my question is, are there um, sort of ways to take the analysis and what it's showing into policy and planning uh, kind of more directly? Because it, at least from my perspective, it, it's been harder to make decisions that are based on watershed level planning, uh, you know, in terms of municipal uh, level decisions, but I'm wondering if kind of introducing the heat aspect of it can somehow help sort of push, push the argument on looking at green infrastructure or, you know, heat resilience at a watershed level uh, because of the way the policy uh, can be framed. That's certainly the hope. Your your question is excellent, and it's very timely because in this in this watershed plan example that I showed to you, half of that watershed is in Bridgeport and half is in Stratford. One of the examples that I had of a community master plan was Stratford. So at least those two efforts are well timed, right? So Stratford's producing a master plan at the same time as this watershed plan. So there's going to be a direct way to incorporate findings from the watershed plan. That's the hope. But Bridgeport already has a master plan and won't work on one for another seven years. Right. So it's going to take a sustained um, kind of nudging the whole time. Hey, this watershed plan is done. Can now mm -hmm. you, can we put this in the master plan and can it go into the zoning regulations? And it takes the work that Luann talked about. It takes it takes all of us to remember to push our communities to incorporate information from watershed plans into master plans and into zoning. Right. I wish I had a magic way to do it. Um, there isn't one, but at least it's a it's a first step is to get extreme heat as a as a component of watershed plans, because people don't think about it. It's not logical. This is a plan yeah. about runoff. Why would you include something about extreme heat? But if if it can right. help you choose locations to do yeah. things, then that's that's the goal. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Pallavi. And that brings us to time. So I wanna thank everybody again, especially our helpful friends from Circa for joining today to learn and teach about this tool. Um, there is lots of helpful links in the chat if anyone wants to take them down before we go. And this webinar will also be recorded on our Sustainable CT website, as mentioned before, as long as well as on Circa's website. So I am very happy to have seen everybody attend and hope everybody has a great rest of their day.